Dan Rubenstein, week one, now a little bit more in the books. Yeah. Since we last convened on Saturday night, we've got an LSU-USC result to discuss here at time of Ooh. recording. We're doing this on Labor Day Monday, early afternoon-ish. There is a game tonight that we will discuss if we need to a little bit later on in the week between Boston College and Florida State. But alas, a couple hours removed from the first full Saturday of college football We've got some additional thoughts that we need to get off our chest, sir. How are you? I'm great. And now that you say that today is Labor Day, which it is, and I'm going to a cookout in a little while, it reminds me that that was Marcus Freeman's final opportunity to wear those <laughs> snug white pants. He's going to have to go darker for the season. That was his moment to shine, the, the snug white chinos, whatever those were. Uh, good for him for getting them in just into just in the nick of time, just under the gun tie. Very snug. They are extraordinarily <laughs> snug, to say the least. Hey, real quick, it'd be great if you could consider subscribing to the YouTube channel down below. It really helps us out. We had a game between a great game. USC and LSU that I want to discuss. We also need to continue the trend we started last Tuesday in going back and getting some lingering thoughts off of our chest. And then I did want to talk at the end of this episode a little bit about the week ahead, what week two is going to look like for people who are trying to do some advanced planning and just call out some of the good games, some of the sneaky good games that I think are worth monitoring. Certainly, we're going to be doing our pick em game at Verballers.com. Some of these will be part of that. So just want to kind of get out ahead of what this coming week two looks like because it looks to be a baller of a week as so we good. discussed on the last episode. Got a full show here today to say the least so why don't we start with the usc game usc 27 to 20 what was your watch situation for this game yeah what were your emotions what were your feels as you watched new big 10 team usc which i will never get used to ever i was early this morning scrolling my phone looking through the score app trying to get stats for the usc game and i couldn't find the pac-12 Oh. Or I couldn't find them in the Pac-12. In the Pac-12, right, right, right. So it's hitting different for me, too. I, I did it when I was looking through through scores Saturday night. I was like, all right, let's go on the ACC. Let's go on what's going on in the Mountain West. And I got to the P, and I was like, oh, just these two. Yeah. 27-20, USC emerges the victor. You were high on USC coming into this game. I was, and in the fall. Like, I, I was pretty low on them earlier on. But then when I s sort of considered the, the totality of the transfers on defense and the new coaches on defense, I was like, look, th this is everything, right? If this doesn't work for Lincoln Riley, it's not working for Lincoln Riley at USC. So there, there was that emotional element of like, this is a kitchen sink situation for the Trojans. So coming into this game, I, I felt decent about them. This was, what do we say about Nick Saban? That like, you don't want to be the guy after the guy. Yeah. It turns out in this game, being the guy after the guy, whether it was after Jaden Daniels or after Caleb Williams, pretty decent place to be given these situations. I, I think that's fair. So what were your impressions in watching this game and how did it compare to your impressions going into this game? Okay. I mean, immediately I was impressed with USC's defense. Immediately the job Danton Lynn did and seeing how pressure works, seeing how pressure didn't work, uh, seeing USC sort of shadow and pick up on what LSU was trying to do on offense and not always successfully, but like they had a concept, they had a guy there. Right. And that guy there, whether it was, uh, was Macarenas Arnold, the, uh, the linebacker or, uh, Ramsey, the safety who came in from UCLA, like they just had, they had Cardinal and gold jerseys where they were supposed to be on defense and they were like hitting hard. Like, that was the immediate thing that I wanted to see from this game. I also wanted to see it on the other side from LSU, but I thought the starting point from a talent standpoint from LSU's defense, especially up front, was in a better place, right? When Harold Perkins is there, when all these guys are there, that we know can be disruptive. I was more curious about USC's defense. And then just the impression of both of these quarterbacks, just especially in that first half, like really strong command, right? That they weren't trying to play outside of themselves, but they weren't dinking and dunking, right? They were taking chances downfield. There was a comfort and there was a, I think, a, a boldness to both of these quarterbacks. Like, they came out both crazy impressive, which with what LSU lost at receiver, cool to see, and with what USC should be doing, giving the receiver talent that they have, impressive to see. So just all around, like, quality would be the word I would use to describe what I saw. If I'm a USC fan right now, I'm thrilled. Yeah, of course. I'm thrilled. Not just for the win, 
but because this was essentially a two question test on Sunday night against LSU and they passed it with flying colors. The first question was the defense. Can they be better? Can they look better? The answer to that was absolutely yes. Now they gave up over 400 yards. Okay. Sure. My favorite reference. They're not the 85 bears. They bent. They did limit the breakage. But the energy, the effort, the things that you can't necessarily quantify definitely look better. The tackling, the tackling was a lot better compared to a year ago. It was like night and day. So they were, they were good in that respect. And I always say another measure of effort is red zone. Oh man, that fourth down stop early. This team was terrible a year ago in the red zone. This season, starting off against LSU, good offense. Look better. Look yeah. better. If that is a measure of effort, if that is part of what ailed USC from a defensive standpoint a year ago, many years before that, that all seemed better to me. Again, I reemphasize, just marginally better this year. Yeah. Just marginally better. We say this every year about a Lincoln Riley team. If they're just marginally better. And if the offense, by the way, to I'll build on this in a second. If the offense remains somewhat close to the same as they were a year ago, USC is going to blow past every projection that people had for them this season. I think that's right. This and that proper brings, overreaction. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the second question, I said it's a two question test, was offense. Yeah. Specifically quarterback, which you mentioned. Miller Moss, who I feel like I underplayed his abilities because we hadn't seen a whole lot of him. We saw him in mop, mop up duty spring and, games. Yeah. And when we talked about him on this show and I'm kind of pointing the finger at myself here, I was treating him as the guy that they were going to go to by default. You lose Caleb Williams. They're going to be something of a step back, right? Is it Miller Moss? Is it Jade Maiava? They've got options there, but Oh, they're just going to go with the guy who they've had. And it's, it's just like a backup who's being promoted. They don't have somebody better. So this is their, Full stop, man. He was good. He was good. He was calm really back there. He knew where to go with the football. It was clear he knew the plays. When he had to throw and put the put the ball in a spot, he was throwing dimes. To your point, they weren't afraid to stretch the field. I just thought this was really solid. I thought he showed arm talent. I thought this was an incredibly clean game. And if you're a USC fan, again, this is all very positive because taking the step back from Caleb to now Miller Moss, it who knew? Not the best defense in the world. Brian Kelly. We can talk about Brian Kelly in a second. Yep. I think Brian Kelly knows as much. But yeah, for a first glimpse of a new quarterback and a new defense, I don't know what more you could possibly want if you're a USC fan. This was a really, really strong showing in week one. No, in in an uncomfortable place. Not because it was they're you know, they're not playing at Death Valley, they're not playing at LSU, but like it's uncomfortable because it's not a normal type setup playing in an NFL stadium in Vegas. It's just, you know, visually different. The vibes are different playing in a stadium like that. And it's true for both teams, of course, but LSU has played in more of these games recently uh, in these types of stadiums. These players are a little bit, it seems more familiar. Brian Kelly has played in these games more recently. It seems. Who knows? But, yeah, the other thing with USC is offensive line wasn't great. The LSU defensive front really manhandled them a bunch. And Miller Moss was able to get the ball out quickly, right? He took some shots. He had... A couple of those in the second half, those balls batted him to the air that looked, you know, floated dangerously down. Or I think one of them got technically picked off but stripped right away. Right. USC was able to benefit from a couple of extremely close calls with their the inside of their offensive line struggling against LSU. And so I don't know how many times USC actually wins this game if it's simulated a hundred times, but the one that was played Sunday night worked out pretty well for the Trojans. And one of the big reasons why. Met that receiving core. We talked about it a little bit. To me, when you look at what's Lake McCree at tight end, Deuce Robinson is at receiver, but sort of a hybrid size wise because right. six six and a bigger receiver. Um, Jacoby Lane is a big body. Zachariah Branch smaller. Kyron Hudson smaller. But like those three or four big receivers, I get a little bit of the like early 20 teens Stanford vibes, right? Where you're just like, they have four dudes that are 6'4 and above on the field at the same time. You're Arthego Whitesides, right? You're Kobe Fleeners. Uh, there was something about that where you're just like, 
they're going to body up some teams. They're going to yeah. post teams up. Like Lincoln Riley is smart enough to know this, whether it's the red zone, whether it's a third and seven, whatever. And you saw LSU struggle. You saw those receivers make those big plays going up, right? One-handed, whatever, in traffic. They're going to be a problem for a lot of teams. And the change of pace with Zachariah Branch. Still worried about this offensive line. Again, just pushed around for a lot of this game. I think that's still a big question. And they won't play defensive fronts that looks like LSU's all season long. You know, it won't be an every week thing. But came away super impressed with Miller Moss composure, leading that last second, you know, game winning drive. Woody Marks, by the way, tough runner. Look good. Look for USC good, yeah. gives them a nice option, had the game winning run in, but got some tough yards, some big big plays and big moments. So Again, maybe they only win this game, you know, 68 times out of 100, but they look like they were better prepared. They're certainly more disciplined with those the penalties and the targeting at the end that LSU had, you know, the penalty after a touchdown LSU had. Like it just seemed like the the USC players, you know, were better prepared to have cool heads and not let something else dictate this game as I'm sure Brian Kelly was alluding to in his press or after you, I think you actually have the audio as I have a transition the audio. if you want. Yeah, I have the, the sweet setup ice, man. I'll, I'll get to yeah. that in a second. The only other point on USC, maybe I am dooming my fighting Irish by saying this, but yeah, it's a long time until that game, right? Long time until this game, this game's at the end of the year. As of now, after week one, yeah. I am thrilled as a Notre Dame fan because, and you know, I talked about this, this is going to be the argument that people make against Notre Dame because the schedule is very beneficial. Already have. It, it looked that way on paper. It looked like you get past A&M and then it is pretty much smooth sailing. There's a Florida State game in there, but that one's at home. As we get into November, Florida State's already 0-1. We'll see what they do tonight. Again, we're recording this on Labor Day. The USC game is on the road. It's the last game of the year. The The kind of I guess, set up for that game that we discussed in the preseason was, well, they're over under seven and a half. There are all these questions. Yeah. The defense might not be any better, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly now, USC throws its hat in the ring, not just as like a contender in the Big Ten, yeah. but also somebody that's more relevant on the national level and definitely serves to benefit Notre Dame's strength of schedule. By the way, I understand why you did it, Ty. It's a totally defensible thing you just did. But shout out to you for taking this result and saying, how can I make it about my team? That's what we do. That's what, <laughs> how can I make it about Notre Dame? Is that Dame? not what everybody does? It is absolutely the most real college football <laughs> reaction. But what it, what does this do for me? This is this um, is a tribal sport. You love yeah. who you love. No, totally acceptable. But I, I always enjoy it. And I probably would have done the same if Oregon uh, were playing USC this year, which I don't believe they are. Um, other side, LSU. Other side. So... If if this is a show about honesty, yeah, this was the most honest post game presser I have ever seen from Brian Kelly, ever. And I have watched so many of these hollow kind of manufactured quotes from him over the years, dating back to his time at Notre Dame. Yeah, this was pure. This was unadulterated frustration. How could the players do this to Brian Kelly? Was this the sort was, of theme of it? This was pure, unadulterated frustration. Yeah. More so than I can ever remember seeing from him in the past. There is a snippet making the rounds on social media. I do have the audio here. I'm going to play it. It's like Please. 20 seconds long or so. And let's let's talk about this and more kind of on the flip side. We had some guys played their butts off tonight. And, and we're sitting here again. We're sitting here again <laughs> talking about the same things about not finishing when you have an opponent in a position to put him away. But what we're doing on the sideline is feeling like the game's over. So that thud you heard about five seconds in was him slamming a table. Yeah. It's clear. He's not faking this. He was, he was frustrated. BK felt like this one was there for LSU. And I think it's a fair assumption. He felt like they gave it away. And he was yeah. angry about three things in particular. The first was penalties. You talked about the targeting. Yeah. But there were two personal foul penalties in this game that set up points for USC. That stuff does not help. They were sloppy on that front. The second was red zone offense. We talked about the red zone defense for USC. Obviously, BK sees it from his perspective as leaving points out there, settling for field goals in close games, putting a strain on a defense that, in his words, not mine. Yeah was not ready to carry that type of burden for an offense that wasn't executing. 
And then the third, the reason why he slammed the desk was, in effect, killer instinct, not putting USC away when he felt like they had some momentum. So if I'm an LSU fan now, I understand feeling frustrated. And I think the emotions that Kelly spoke to are probably very real right now among the message borders and across LSU Twitter and whatnot. What I would say, though, is I don't think you should feel surprised by what you saw, because this was an offense that lost a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback that lost yeah. Malik Neighbors, was 79th in returning production on that side of the ball, even with a veteran quarterback, Dan. Garrett sure. Nussmeyer, who for his own right was not terrible, right? Was, no, was fine. been around for a while. Yeah. But I thought it was really good, to be honest. But even with that, it should not come as a great shock that you're going to get an incomplete performance in week one totally. with so much turnover. And again, on the defensive side, right? This is this defense was full on bad a year ago. Yeah. They went out, they paid Blake Baker a ton of money to come in and try and try and solve that problem. Kelly's right. They're probably not at the point yet where they can lean on that defense. But I did think there was some improvement there. I, I thought, generally speaking, and he spoke to this as well in the presser, it seemed like they were they were better at tackling. They competed on the edges more. There, there were no, definite the, the arms signs and there. arms and passing lanes, right? That like was Savion Jones and Whit Weeks were making plays all yeah. over the field. It was great. Harold Perkins was there, making plays. There were definite signs there that the effort level that the production is going to improve this season. But again, I don't I don't think this should come as a great shock. I would say bigger picture, try to avoid the freak out because recruiting is still really good. They're evolving the way that they use the portal. It's going to be fine in the long run. Right. And they've got six weeks to work out the kinks before the schedule really heats up in week seven with Ole Miss coming to town and then it starts rolling downhill. So my general thought here is it was there for LSU. They definitely committed some big time mistakes. I do think it will get better. I came away generally impressed with both teams, feeling like both are headed in a good direction, yes. especially USC in 2024. Yeah, I, I wouldn't surprise me at all if we're in mid-October and talking about LSU as like a like good thing USC didn't get LSU in week seven. Kind exactly. Of thing, right. Exactly. My thoughts. Exactly. And you know what? Maybe it's a good thing LSU didn't get USC in week seven, right? Maybe the offensive line comes together a little bit more. Miller Moss is going to be nothing but more comfortable in this offense as like the guy by then as well. Yeah. But LSU's to me, just because of how disrupted that defensive line can be and will be this year, I could see this LSU defense sort of morphing into something consistently scary this year. And so, and the offense as well, right? Like the best of Kyron Lacey, the best of John Emery last night with explosion plays. Like there's, there are new faces who are going to be counted on like, the new starters, the new presumed stars or whatever. These guys are guys who've contributed for a while. But no, I think this is going to be a tale of, of two teams who are really going to continue to grow. A lot of playmakers on both sides. We saw that playmaking ability. It was yeah. a good game. It was a good game to watch. I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. You got anything you want to get off your chest from Saturday? Because I've got a, a, oh, I've a, got like a, lot. a five or six pack here of things that I've been stewing over over the last couple hours. Okay, so mainly that North Dakota drive that took 12 minutes against Iowa State. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. We have to properly set up these segments before you we have to hit the button. That's what do you expect? I was trying to get you to agree with me before I hit the button. Oh, okay. Alas. Yes, Ty. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Give me your give me your leftover feels from week one. Um. I went back and watched the Notre Dame A&M game in closer detail and really came away impressed with Notre Dame's ability to wear down A&M over the course of that game and look better prepared in bigger moments. Um, I, I, I got to see Riley Leonard throw the ball downfield a little bit more. I know. That's the I know. Th like if that was our question coming in, like who are the playmakers outside? Like Bo Collins made plays. I was like, oh, OK, uh, are, are we going to have an offense that is like dangerous in multiple different ways? Or is it going to be Riley Leonard left, Riley Leonard right on third and five? Well, and I think I think there were positive signs later in the game because okay. I saw Pete Sampson, our friend from The Athletic, reference this as well. It did seem as if the offensive line not only came together, but was better conditioned. Yeah. And that definitely had an effect the deeper you got into the game. And it was clear they kind of did on offense what I joked they should do. Of course, leaning back on my college football 25 experience for whatever that's worth. But 
My point was, look, it's a new line. Six projected starts returning spread out among only two guys on that line. If there are any questions about their ability to protect Riley Leonard, to give him time to throw, look for a lot of swing passes, look for a lot of quick stuff, look for them to move the pocket, use Riley Leonard in the running game. They did all of that stuff. The line did seem as if it got better. Yeah. From a skill standpoint later in the game. Yeah. Due to conditioning, due to scheme tweaks, I don't know. But they got better across the board later in that game. If they can continue to improve, as they did from the start of that game to the end, ac- across the entire season, I would think that would bode pretty well for their ability to maybe stretch the field, to maybe show some of what they can do in the vertical passing game, because we know Mike Denbrock wants to do that. Yes. We just didn't see it in week one against a good defense like AM. I hope Hammer and Hank Bachmeyer continues his ways at Wake Forest. Successful oh, yeah. ways. A uh, little, getting a little bit. If I'm going to overreact, a little bit worried about the Duke offense not really doing much against Elon, and we're seeing them this week, right? You and I in person against Northwestern. We that, we will be at the Northwestern game in that portable stadium. Yes, for the Friday night game against Duke. Northwestern currently a three point favorite. I'm excited. Uh, elsewhere in the ACC, uh, I don't know if you saw Fran Brown's quote about Ryan Day and sending him champagne for letting Kyle McCord go, but. <laughs> I love, I love speaking with your chest. I hope this works out, but this is a man after my own heart, sort of talking loud after week one. I love it. Yeah. Kyle um, McCord had a good game. He did have a good game. And I, I I love Fran Brown for having his guy like that, being so happy with Kyle McCord. I love that. Uh, Cal might be in trouble <laughs> in the ACC. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jaden Ott was not able to run against, listen, I've, I've spent time on the UC Davis campus. Davis is a lovely place. Davis should not be shutting down Jaden Ott. <laughs> Right. Okay. Cal might be in for it, but it's game one. It's game one all the same. Your SMU Mustangs won nicely. I don't know if there was any takeaway from SMU against was against Abilene Christian. Hopefully everybody okay. I saw not Abilene Christian, excuse me, a Houston Baptist. Houston Baptist, right. It was my reference to everybody okay. Abilene Christian, there was a car accident with the oh, bus yeah. with Tex after the Texas Tech game. I think it was a drunk driver. Oh man. Awful to hear. Hopefully everybody is okay and there aren't serious injuries Jeez. there. Uh Anthony Calandria. Nice to see that. Again, it's Richmond, but, you know, he's the guy at Virginia. So he went off. That was really nice. He's fun as hell, too. He's really fun. He's so much fun to watch. Uh, Stray thought thought Nate Yarnell would be the guy at Pitt. Eli Holstein went off. Can I talk about Pitt for a second? Take a second. I want to talk about Pitt for a second. Yeah. Because I thought this new offense looked incredible. It was against Kent State. Kent State is not good. Yeah. That That's your disclaimer. But they did start Eli Holstein. He's the Alabama transfer. He looked really good, Dan. Yes. And I just kept thinking, if you are one of our pit listeners out there, and I know there are plenty of them because they've written to us over the years, I just kept thinking, if you've been watching this offense struggle through the Keaton Slovises and Christian Veyus and Nick Patties, anybody who came after Kenny Pickett over the last couple of years, And remember those slower plotting offenses that just were not any good. I just kept thinking how much of a breath of fresh air this had to have been because they played quick. They scored 55 points. Defense, a little bit of a different story. They, for the most part, held down Kent's offense. There were a couple moments where they gave up big plays. They've got a game this week against Cincinnati that should give us more of a tell for how they look from a complete team standpoint. I was thrilled, though, and I imagine I would, would want to hear from Pitt fans if they feel similarly. I was thrilled to see Eli Holstein look as good as he did and just see that offense really transform into something completely different than yeah. what it's been over the years. Uh, shout out to Kennesaw, down five in their very first FBS game to UTSA, Owen McCown and UTSA, but this was a game deep into the fourth quarter that UTSA pulled out. The Owl's right there, Ty. I always enjoy that, right? Stepping up and ready to roll. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, Continue. I was a bit unimpressed with the version of Avery Johnson we saw for K-State. Kind of shaky early. Uh, I'm not selling my stock, Ty. No. Just just like Dabo tells you not to do with Clemson, I'm holding, Ty. I am. I wouldn't wouldn't sell the stock, but I don't know if we fully know what the offense is going to be. I I do think it's going to be built around the running game, and I think that that was pretty clear in week one, because in theory, anyway, 
the three-headed monster of DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards and Avery Johnson, who's a really good runner, should be pretty dynamic. If Saturday was any indication, though, the pass will be a function of that rushing attack. Yes. And so most of the bigger plays that we saw in this game anyway, it was plays off of misdirection. It was guys leaking out of the backfield. That type of thing. And Avery Johnson was good on those plays. Don't get me wrong. But there were other moments where he had a ton of time to throw it. He was inaccurate. Chose to throw it into traffic. Almost nothing was down the field. So he's raw as a passer. And I feel like we knew that last year. It's it's again the case this year. Has wonderful hair, of course. Of course. But the passing side of his game is something we need to watch more closely. Yeah. And I got to say, Tulane, which I will talk about momentarily, Tulane hosts K-State this week. And if Tulane is going to play the style of football that we saw them play in week one, that's interesting going into this week two matchup. Because yeah. they can limit possessions. They've got a good coach who knows how to play defense. I'm not picking Tulane outright. I haven't done the study Do on what I expect Do in it. this game. I'm not doing that. I'm not I'm not going there with it yet. Maybe I will by Thursday. I gave you I gave you the opening for USC. I gave you the opening for Vandy. Ty. Do it. We'll Look, see. I'm I like Tulane more that after just one week against Southeast Louisiana, whoever it was, Southeast Louisiana State. I like them more than I expected. Okay. They they won the game by 52, 52 to nil. Pretty good. John Sermall's first game, everybody's excited about him. Everyone's got him on their list of one of the best coaching hires this offseason. They started Darian Mensa, not your guy, Ty Thompson. At not Ty Thompson. Darian Mensa from San Luis Obispo, your favorite place in the world. He do, only threw like it 12 Obispo, times. Yeah. He only threw it 12 times. They ran it nearly 40 times for 240 some odd yards and four touchdowns. The K-State game's at home next week. The Oklahoma game is on the road the week after, so they've got some heavy hitters on this schedule. We will break those down in due time, but I just I just want to get out ahead of this and say, if Tulane is building the entire plane <laughs> out of a beast of a ground assault, I don't know what that means for K-State. I don't know what that means for Oklahoma. They are going to absolutely maul the other G5 teams on this schedule. Yes. They are going to kill them if they can run with this level of effectiveness against the remainder of its schedule outside of these power conference opponents. So, again, I will talk more about the K-State game, but I was really impressed by what John Summerall did in his first game. Darian Mensa looked really good. So just something to keep your eyes on and, and you know monitor as we go through here. But they could be really good. Do you have any objection to me calling Chandler Morris Chamo? If he keeps Chamo, playing, no, not at Chamo, all. Chamo, if he keeps playing like this for the mean green, nice win. Still no defense, but they should be fun and put up a bunch of points. Um, any any stray thoughts from the American? Uh, well, I mean, I, I had the Tulane thought. My right. my stray other thought on the G five level is Northern Illinois. Okay. If I'm a Northern Illinois fan, I'm over the moon. I am over the moon. There is a caveat. It was a game against the Western Illinois Leathernecks, so take it's a look at the game against song. Ty's junior high. Yeah, my junior high. This needed to be an enormous win, and it was fifty-four to four or fifty-four to fifteen. Excuse me. Yeah. The question I had about this team coming into the season when I did the preview was, what's going to be the quarterback situation? There's a fair amount back elsewhere, especially in offense. What is the quarterback situation going to look like? They gave it to Ethan Hampton. He went eighteen of twenty. 328 and five touchdowns. NIU has had the Rocky Lombardi experience, who was okay at best the last couple years. Right. But this offense with actually, capital A, actually good quarterback play. Wow. Is interesting. It is interesting. Okay. And it makes the Mac potentially more than the two horse race than we thought, which was Toledo and Miami, Ohio. It's been that way for most of our natural lives at this point. But if NIU can get that quarterback play and get a little bit more pop, it makes their case very interesting in the MAC this year. Uh, NIU has Notre Dame this week. We may get a better indication for what they're made of in that game or not. I yeah, you know, baby. I, I'm not gonna pick NIU. I'm not picking NIU. I'm not doing that. We'll probably get a better sense for for who they are this week against a much better defense. But 
I was really encouraged by Ethan Hampton. I thought he looked awesome. I'm going to do the voice that I've been doing. It's it's vaguely Shredder-esque from the animated Ninja Turtle show from all those years ago. How could you tie Hildenbrand? <laughs> a little bit. It's a little Shreddery. Um, I have Big 12 thoughts. Okay. Uh, TCU had a defense at times. TCU did, did a nice job at times getting crucial stops against Stanford. TCU gave up 27 points. That's okay. To Stanford on the road. That's okay. They got stops when it counted. They held the the pass. I mean, Alec Ao Manor got his. He, I think he went barely over a hundred, but I, I think they did a nice job. We're talking about steps, Ty. Yeah. Progress okay. is not linear. I think sure. there's progress from TCU in week one on the road in a weird place. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. Um, Brendan Storsby, lit it oh, up for yeah. Cincinnati. Yeah. I appreciate that. You should against Towson. You should do it, and he did what you should do. I mentioned the North Dakota thing. They just limited possessions against Iowa State. This wasn't ever really a game to me. Yeah. Uh, Taquan Finn struggled through a couple picks. I only watched a little bit of this, clips-wise, against Tarleton. I'm not yeah. worried yet, but I'm monitoring, Ty. I talked to our friend Peter Pope. I, I texted with him. Yeah. After the game or during the game, and he said the first half was good. The second half was sloppy as hell. And Okay. You know, Finn's arm is much better when he's on the run, which I think we knew that was kind of his MO back at Toledo. Um, we just didn't see a whole lot of it in this game. The defense, I think, was more the story from his standpoint. Peter, who True. follows Baylor and, and has for an eternity. Um, they look better. They were bad a year ago. Dave Aranda made the news this offseason by taking back control of that defense. And they did in Peter's words, exactly what they should have done against an inferior opponent. So I think that might be the better story to highlight here and to monitor now as we get a little bit deeper into this Big 12 season. Anything else from the Big 12 from you? Not from the Big 12. I have I have a Big 10 thought. I can't believe I'm saying this about the Washington Huskies, but I have a Please. Big 10 thought and I have an SEC thought. The, the Washington thing to me that's worth mentioning is the run defense. It was not good in the first half against Weber State. That's okay. It did get better. It did get better. But the thought that kept coming to mind for me was, this is a team that plays Rutgers, Michigan, Iowa, Penn State, and Oregon. And if you want to put Woody Marks and USC in that class, you can as well. These are mm -hmm. all teams that can run the football. Yeah. So maybe it was a slow start. I tend to attribute much more of any any deficiencies we see in week one to being a slow start and rustiness and all that. And trying to be probably as vanilla as possible against an opponent you know you're going to beat. Totally. Yeah. Totally, totally, totally. That's all true. I do think the run defense is worth monitoring, though. They look okay. good on offense. It took them a little bit to get going, but it, you know, Jed Fish had a, had a good offense out there. Will Rogers was better after he warmed up. They've got weapons out wide. I, I think the offense will be fine, but the, the, the run defense in particular – is, I think, something worth monitoring. They were pretty good in the secondary. They look good there. But just the right. run defense and and what they look like against other opponents in the Big Ten that we know can run the football will be interesting to chart. Two things, two stray thoughts on the Big Ten. Uh, punt, interception, punt, missed field goal, <laughs> punt, interception. Who has that? Who Whose first half was that? Any guesses? You tell me. UCLA. Was it Iowa? Yeah. It was UCLA. Say, somebody other than Iowa. Did not score a single point in the first half against Hawaii. It's week one. It's a, a, a long flight there. It's a different kind of place. I'm monitoring. I'm filing this away for UCLA. It's going to need, we're going to need quick improvement. They have LSU very soon, do they not? Yep. They have yep. LSU yep. this month. So figure it out, UCLA. <laughs> figure it out. I know there's a lot of new things. I was excited to see this offense with Eric Bieniemy. Just like, hey, that's a no. big name hire. Let's see what, when he has his hands on uh, a college team, what he does. Do you know who the, PFF, again, I have no idea how the, any of this is calculated or how any of this, you know, the, the tabulation, I don't know, any of this. PFF's number one team as for, I think it's like general quality of play, like the most players who are high level in their performance this week. Your Rutgers Scarlet Knights were America's number That's one right, team baby. in terms of performance against their opponent. They were incredible against Howard. That's, that was the only nugget killed that him. I took away from that. They killed him. They absolutely yeah. killed him. Um, Anything from the, the Big PFF Ten point. otherwise? Well, Sorry. nothing from the Big Ten, but, but more to the PF point, PFF point. Excuse yes. me. Um, Brock Vandegrift was the highest graded offensive player for Kentucky. Whoa. 
Great. And they won 31 nil over Southern Miss in a game that was called early in the third quarter because of lightning. Yeah. But the bit that we did see was good. It was good. If you're a card carrying Vandegrifter the way Dan and I are, yeah. Brock Vandegrift did nothing to throw cold water on any of the preseason optimism that we have had that we talked about with Nick Roosh from Kentucky Sports Radio when we did that show a couple months back. I thought the better news actually on the offensive side was the way that Bush Hamden maybe tipped off a little bit how he wants to approach a defense. And they had a ton of explosion plays in this game, but there was a lot of propensity to stretch a team from side to side and then attack vertically. Pull them apart, right? attack the seams. Pull them apart, attack vertically. And I thought that was really interesting to see. I'm curious to see how it portends to Kentucky's performance when it comes to the Georgia game a couple weeks from now. Agree. I think that would be an ideal way to attack Georgia if they can pull it off. If they can pull it off. Noted qualifier. Noted. But at least with what we saw here from Vandegrift and from some of the other playmakers on that team and the way that they schemed, I, I was really encouraged by what we saw there. So uh would like to see him play a full game against a better opponent. That goes without saying, but through one week anyway, you, I think, feel pretty good about being the Vandegrifter. Like I, I agree. Um, can I go to the Mountain West real quick? Oh, yeah, please. Um, we got to see Kenny Amatololo run a team that – wasn't running the option and they won they won they scored 40 points they had a receiver that had 170 i was nick nash i believe for the spartans uh emmett brown threw it well so we have proof of concept ish with san jose state and kenny Matalolo running a non-option offense i think that's cool to see uh also in the mountain west boise state the story is action genty action genty maybe that's what we should call him action uh action Action Genty. genty yeah sure the Boise State defense might be not great. You think they're mud? I think ahead of this week's game against Oregon, I think we're burying not the lead, but maybe a co-lead here. That obviously it's great to have an All-American running back, but they gave up a lot to Georgia hmm. Southern. Week one, can adjust, can sort of see what they, they have and don't have. It's something I'm monitoring, Ty. I'm filing this away for four days from now or whatever. That's okay. All. Anything else? That's all I got. That's all I got. Stray thought wise, leftover thoughts from the weekend that was, in particular, the Saturday games and the Sunday games. If you've got anything out there, there are a couple different ways that you can reach out and let us know. Obviously, social media, we're everywhere. We'd love to hear from you. So send us a tweet or a DM or send us an email, solidverbal at gmail.com. You can either send it to that address or go to our website, hit the contact button. You can also text us on the reverb line, 855-VERBAL-3. We will take your feedback for this show in text format, 855-VERBAL-3 to send us a text message. It pops up on my phone. So if you want to spam me, uh, wow. I get the notifications. I haven't turned them off yet. So that may come a little bit later on this season. Will it, will it be a robot voice reading the text aloud on the reverbs? I can't believe Baylor was unable to stop the pass against Texas Tech. We can get Nancy, our fembot, to do it. Okay, shout out Nancy. We can get her to do it. All right. If there is a text that is that is worthy, 855-VERBAL-3 is where you can send those texts. If you're interested, I'd love to get your stray thoughts, your thoughts on the USC-LSU game as well. Can I just jump ahead a little bit? I would love that. So here is what the week ahead looks like. Ah. Right now we're recording this on Labor Day very early on, but I know the way this works. You start planning your weekend out in advance, and if you need to make any accommodations or anything to try and get yourself in front of a TV, it's never too early to start that planning process, right? You know this. Yes. So from a show standpoint, from what we're doing, Big Ten Breakfast, 9 a.m., live on the YouTube channel on Friday. Friday, yes. We're switching to Friday this week. It was always going to be Friday, but there was one game on Thursday we had to accommodate. That's going to be live uh, Friday morning, 9 a.m. We also have the week two preview episode, which is going to drop Thursday a.m. You can watch the video at noon on YouTube if you're ever so inclined. Eastern, yes. Eastern time. And then the recap The recap was live this past weekend on Saturday night at midnight Eastern. It will again 
and continue to be live midnight Eastern out on our YouTube channel. You can get that audio. If you're not much for staying up late, that's fine too. You can get that audio pretty early on Sunday AM so that you can go through your day, finish out the weekend in style by not only listening to the show, but also bringing yourself up to speed. So that's what our schedule looks like. But as for the actual on-field stuff that we care about, there are a bunch of interesting games. Oh, there's a ton. So many. So the big four games for my money, Texas at Michigan goes without saying. Early, right? Isn't that a big noon Saturday situation? Early game, yes. Yeah. Uh, We got the Cyhawk game. We got Iowa State at Iowa, which should be interesting in its own right. We've got Tennessee, NC State, neutral cider, which I think would be a great game. And then we've got Colorado at Nebraska. Yeah, but you talk about Dan Carlin, and I think is obviously a an old school rivalry. There's a lot riding on that game, really, from both sides of things. So those are like the four big ones that I pulled out. But there are a bunch of sneaky good games, and I think that is where Week Two really earns its keep. It's not the headliners; it's the sneaky good games. One of these is going to end up being an upset. I just feel it in my bones. Arkansas at Oklahoma State. Arkansas put up 70, and Taylor Green looked awesome. That could be interesting. Kansas State at Tulane, I already made the case for that game as a a sneaky good one. Kansas at Illinois, that's only a a five-and-a-half-point line. App State at Clemson, much bigger line, but we know App State can score. Clemson perhaps licking its wounds a little bit. We'll see. App State's one of these G5 teams that I think we're pretty high on, so I want to see what they can do against maybe a, a, a lower level playoff caliber opponent. I don't know what we call Clemson at this point. Yeah. And then you mentioned Boise State. Boise State against your Oregon Ducks. Could Late, be a lot of right? points in that game. Later game, yeah. Man, I'm a little bit nervous, Ty. I'm not going to lie. Can I give you another game that I just like is going to explain a good amount to me, at least like the first half of these, these team schedules or these team seasons? Is it Georgia Tech at Syracuse? Oh, I can't wait for that. Maybe that, that qualifies as well. Is um, it Pitt at Cincinnati? Nope. Is it Marshall at Virginia Tech? No. I also have those games listed. What's yours? Maryland, Michigan State. Oh, okay. Not that I'm expecting a ton of progress from Michigan State, but that performance against FAU left a lot to be desired wolf. from that Michigan was, State. That was a game where you slack me and say woof. Yeah. Woof. Yeah, buzz your girlfriend, woof, right? Wasn't that the origin of me saying woof about things like that? I should pull that sound. We, we uh, could use that sound. I'm pretty excited for Kansas, Illinois, to be honest. Yeah. That was a Illinois made a ton of mistakes last year in Lawrence, but the game is now in Champaign this year. I'm I'm excited for that. I will watch a good chunk of that game. Uh otherwise, no, I think you nailed it. Like I care a little bit less about Houston, but I want to see what Jackson Arnold looks like against probably a team with more of a heartbeat than Temple. I'll do respect Definitely. to the Owls. Definitely. App State Clemson, you mentioned, but Joey Aguilar, experience. This is a I think this is gonna be a good App State team. So curious to just see what the tenor of that game is. I agree. Um otherwise, I think I think you nailed it, Ty. I think that's where Thank we are. Thank you. So one final note here before we let the fine people go. We we did get some feedback. Yes. When we did the week one preview, and specifically, people want the quad father segment back. Oh, what is the customization status of the quad? They have made it more customizable. I was going to say, not fully, not but fully semi. customizable. Yeah. If you're a YouTube TV subscriber, not a sponsor, could be right, but they have given you some liberties to build your own quad box, yeah. which was kind of what we were calling for a year ago, and there were technical reasons why they couldn't, as it's been told to me, but. Beyond that, last season we had this whole segment. It didn't really work as part of the week one preview because of the way that the games were set up. But this week it most certainly does. This week we're going to bring the Quadfather segment back. So we'll go through our big games at the top. We will talk through each of the other windows of games. And Dan, if you want to take it upon yourself to build your custom quads sure. for the early, for the afternoon, for the late games... I would love we can to reincorporate that back into part of the show. Cause that was fun Some, last year and we had good sounds for it. And I enjoyed talking through somebody tweeted me that it needs to be an all TV quad option that it's not just sports because oh. if you have kids okay. that have like a bluey on the upper right quadrant and give them the audio, but you still get the other three uh, quadrants to watch your football. And so sort of everybody's happy on the couch. Okay. I like that idea a lot. Okay. Well, we could see where that goes, but 
fear not, we will be bringing that part, uh, bringing that part back. Excuse yes. me, as part of the show that we do on Thursday, Dan. Can't wait. So look, that's all we got. We appreciate everybody's support. We appreciate your feedback. You know how to reach out. 855 verbal 3 send us a text. SolidVerbal at gmail.com. Send us an email. Reach out on social media. If you've made it this far, hit follow, hit subscribe. We'd love to have you the rest of the way. We've got three episodes every week. One you're one drops. of us. You're if you've one made of us, it this absolutely. far, you're one of us. In the Verbaler Hood, Sunday mornings, Tuesday mornings, Thursday mornings for all your new episodes in audio format. You yeah. can also go out to the YouTube channel and find the video versions as well. Last but certainly not least... Get in on the Pick'em game. We will talk more on Thursday about what this week's prize is going to be, but we had a surge of new subscribers out at Verballers.com who played the game for the $500 gift card. At time of recording, we're still waiting to see who the winner is because there is a Monday night game that was part of that slate. But great interest, great support. It's been a ton of fun to get that game off the ground. Check that out at Verballers.com. And if you're interested in this hat, I have to be the company man. If you're watching... It looks so sharp. Merch.solidverbal.com is where we've got our three new shirts or three new hats or four new hats, whatever it is. We've got new mugs and water bottles and all sorts of stuff that are for you out there at merch.solidverbal.com, Dan. True or false, you wore that to Wegmans and on three different occasions you had to say, look, I'm flattered, but I'm married. This is false. This is ah, absolutely false. I haven't been just out of because this- of the hat. I haven't been out of this house in about two weeks at this point. <laughs> Fair. Thank you one and all for your undying support. It is great to be here with you talking through some of our stray thoughts, talking about the week ahead, talking about a good game last night between USC and LSU. There's another big one tonight at time of recording again, Boston College against Florida State. We'll talk about that one a little bit later on in the week. But in the meantime, gear up for week two. We will be by your side a little bit later on this week. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrandt, as always, stay solid. Peace.